what I want to look at this morning, if I had a text a title, it could be Gain Equals Loss. But I really want to look at a biblical perspective on life. And so, through these verses right here, let's read them, verse 1 through 8. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me, indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. And all God's people need to say amen right there. Amen. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. And here's his things that he uh, has accomplished, if you will circumcised the eighth day and of the stock of Israel I'll explain all these in momentarily of the tribe of Benjamin a Hebrew of the Hebrews is touching the law of Pharisee concerning zeal persecuting the church touching the righteousness which is in the law blameless but what things were gained to me those I counted loss for Christ henceforth the title this morning Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is of, uh, of that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So, basically, I want you to have and look at a, per, a biblical perspective on life. So, uh, if I had any introduction this morning, I want to look at the definition of perspective. That's a word you've got to be careful with. Perspective does mean everything in life. Now, now, there are fleshly lessons, and there are scriptural, biblical lessons this morning on this definition. So... Uh, and let's think about that in context here. Paul gives both here. He gives the flesh and he gives the spirit here. And so he gives the fleshly things and the things of the Bible. But the art of drawing solid objects, this is a definition of perspective, the art of drawing solid objects on a two-dimensional surface as to give the right impression of their height, their width, their depth and position in relation to each other when viewed from a particular point. Henceforth, we have a perspective drawing. Now, I got to believe this is a little dated. Okay? It says two dimensional. We're a little past that now. We got three dimensional. We got four dimensional. You know, you can take this computer that we got here, this uh, tablet this morning, and if I had sense enough to run it, but I could show you a demonstration of a building, an object. Of, I can give you before and after what it's going to look like after these things are done to it. And man, you can flip that thing around and you can get it on all kind of sides and stuff. So that's a, a drawing perspective. So it's a uh, drawing like solid objects on two-dimensional surface to give the right impression of their height, width, depth, and position in relation to each other. Now the next one would be, uh, the definition two of perspective is a particular attitude toward a way of regarding something, in other words, a point of view. So we're gonna deal with both of those subjects this morning looking at that. So keep that in mind as we look at a biblical perspective on life. Now, we as believers ought to handle and bring every situation into a biblical perspective. In other words, we ought to take a situation that comes into our lives and put a biblical spin on it. Now, don't let that spin be liberal to you, okay? Not, I know some of you that watch Bill O'Reilly, what does he say? The spin stops here. And you can take anything that I say and that you say and you can put a spin on it. And it can be, you can spin it to hear what you want to hear. You can spin it to, in other words, it can, 
can be nothing that I said in context, but you can take one sentence out and spin that thing and take it out of context. So that's what happens. That's when uh, he uses that quote all the time, the spin stops here. Well, it really don't. He just spins it the way he sees it. <laughs> okay? And I, I, you know, it's just the truth of the matter. But we, as everything that comes into our lives as believers, we're to take that and spin it towards the gospel. How does this imply to my life? God, what are you teaching me through this? This thing that's going on right now, what do I need to learn? I need to be sensitive to your spirit and your leadership. So, therefore, a biblical perspective is what we need to attain. So Paul here, he said, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. And then he says, to write the same things to you, to me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. So the first part here of this verse, rejoice in the Lord, this is nothing more than a biblical perspective of life, right here in front of us. It's laid out. Paul says, and commands, and teaches, and exhorts this church. What is Philippians known for? The church of joy. What is this book known as? The joy book. This letter that is written here from prison, by the way. So it is the joy book. He says, finally, brethren, just rejoice in the Lord. Then he says, to write the same thing to you, to me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. So the second part of this verse, to write the same thing to you. Let's look at this. Here in, uh, let's look at Second Peter. <coughs> And verse number, uh, chapter 1 and verse number 12. If I can get the thing to go here, there we go. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of the things, though you know them, and be established in this present truth. Peter says, I'm not going to be negligent to repeat the word of God to you. Now, what does we always know that repetition is our greatest teacher? It is. The more you do something, uh, I don't care what it is, if you're doing it the wrong way, you're going to develop those wrong habits, just like a golf swing. Uh, it, it, I'm bad enough as it is. But I'm here to tell you, if I went before a PGA two teacher today, and he started quirking my swing and my grip and my stance, I'd be over the ball like a noodle, man. I wouldn't be able to hit it 50 yards. Yet if I were to stick with that correct repetition yeah. over time, maybe in a year, man, I might be, I might shave ten strokes off my game. That's the thing. In a biblical perspective, it's something that we need to keep in mind. So Peter said, I'm not going to be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them. Now, how many times have we read this scripture? in the three years or whatever that I've been in here teaching. It's been several times. And you know what? You're going to hear some of the same scriptures because I don't write it. I just recite it. Mm -hmm. And so it's not that hard. It's just reciting the Word of God, although you better get up here with, and try to have His touch on you. <laughs> or it's going to be impossible to do. But He says... And you established. He said, yeah, I think it me. I think it's good for you. It benefits you as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Knowing that surely I must put on this tabernacle even as the Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able after my decease to have the things always in remembrance. And then he goes on talking about following the uh, cunning, devicely fables and, and all these things in that context there. But back where we are, Paul said, it doesn't grieve me to be repetitious to you. He said the word grieve means it's not sluggish for me. It's not slothful. It's not backwards. Paul is encouraging these Philippians believers to keep the right perspective on repetition of hearing and reading the Word of God. He's basically saying, because I happen to quote and recite the same scriptures from time to time, don't think it's because I'm slacking my study. Don't think the perspective is that I'm slothful or sluggish. He says it doesn't bother me. He said, he said to write the same things to you, 
to me is not grievous. It doesn't bother me. And he says, because it's safe, it's firm, it's certain, it's a truth. It's safe for you. It's better for you. So repetition here is how he uh, does this. And we must have the right respect perspective on the Word of God. And then look at verse 2. Look at these three bewares here. Beware uh, of dogs. And beware means what? To discern mentally. Where's the battle of life? As we say all the time. 26 inches here. And some people listen about 12 inches because they got some big heads. Big thick heads. <laughs> Sometimes mine gets that way. Uh, if we ain't careful. Sometimes God has to do a lot to work through this noodle to get my perspective out of the way and to allow his to come in on the situation. Sometimes that takes weeks for this old boy. And sometimes, thankfully, uh, you can be in a, the right frame of mind and God can speak to you and you can just do what he wants you to do. But anyway, the three bewares here in this word. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of concision. So dogs... Uh, it's basically, you look it up, it means a man of an impure mind. That tells me that in the church, they can be men of unpure minds. They can be people. Who is he writing to? He's writing to the church. He's not writing to the world. Those of us that's been around a while, you, you have to deal with times when people like this because people are people. And, it, and a lot of times it discourages people from coming to church. It discourages people. People need encouragement, man. We get discouraged. We get beat down enough every week. But the, the, the warning here, I want you to mentally put this in a biblical perspective, discern mentally here. Dogs, a man of an unpure mind, evil workers means troublesome, pernicious, destructive, a wrong or unbiblical way of thinking. And concision means to cut up, to mutilate. So Paul is saying, man, you better be aware because there are people that ain't got the right mind even in the midst of your congregation and they're, they're wanting to uh, twist the Word of God. That's why it's not grievous for me to repeat it time and time and time again. You notice the perspective that he's building here. And then he goes on in uh, verse number 3. We read that just a moment ago, but... Verse number 4 through 6, we have another warning here. It's against trusting in works. And he says, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof, he might trust in the flesh out of more. Paul said, Okay, buddy, you want to talk about some things of the flesh? We'll, we'll, we'll cover that. Man, I used to do this. Yeah. And I used to do that. And I used to do this. And he's supposed to lay it down for these legalizers, for these Judaizers who thinks it's by works. And, and people still do. Uh, I mean, we run across a guy yesterday coming home from Kentucky, and, and we stopped in, and, and uh, he had lost his wife for 44 years, and it was just us in this building. And, and so I, I, I said, we need to pray right now. I, I just felt that urge to pray. <coughs> And I asked him, I said, you know, do you know Christ as your Savior? I said, are you going to go to heaven when you die? You know what the words were? I hope so. So see, God put it, put us together right there. There's no doubt we took the back roads home for that one purpose and yep. nothing else. We prayed in this man's business here, but the perspective on life, people still think today... And we always, when we did it before we say it, I guarantee you, if you took back time in your life, you thought at some point, God's going to take your good works, good things you do for people, and are going to weigh them against your bad works, and whichever one outweighs the other is how he's going to determine whether to let you in after you die. We've all had that perspective <clears throat> on life. It's still something. It happened back in Bible days. It's happening now. Why? People are people. We don't change. And we constantly see ourselves in the Word of God. But here, he, Paul said, okay, we'll talk about this. He said, uh, though I might also have confidence. He said the things, he lists this grocery list of things that 
he accomplished in the religious works world. Circumcise the eighth day. Well, that was what they had to do. You know the story of, of circumcision. We can deal with that maybe at a later date if we ever go through Romans. We'll deal specifically for several topics on circumcision, although I, I can deal with it right now. <laughs> it was just a work God told them to go do and uh, to show that they was believing in God so then it become a custom that they do it on the eighth day when they're eight days old. Jesus himself went through the same custom. So that way he wouldn't break uh, none of the law. So anyway, circumcised eight day, check. Of the stock of Israel, doing what they told me to do, yep, check. Of the tribe of Benjamin, check. Hebrew of the Hebrews. That means a teacher of the teachers. <coughs> Check. Going through that custom. As touching the law of Pharisee. Know the law. Man, did he not know the word of God. He knew it. And so, check. We got that. Concerning zeal, you want to think you some? I persecuted the church, big boy. I come and lock folks up. <coughs> I come and uh, kill people. I sit there and watch Stephen Stone and who knows how many others. I was holding their coats. <coughs> but you know something he never got away from? While he was holding the coat of Stephen, and he looked down at this man of God. Mm -hmm. Remember, man, we'll have to go over it sometimes in the book of Acts, chapter 6. Boy, how that Stephen looked and he stood up or he looked up at heaven and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. And he said, Son, he said, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Paul never got away from that. Mm -hmm. God started working on him through that. But anyway, he said, it's persecuting the church. You got nothing. You ain't went as far as I have in that. And he says, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. If there was righteousness, that was in there. He said, I knew it. I lived it. I done it. But he's fitting to lay out to these folks it's still what enough. That's what he's getting at. That's what he's building up is his perspective there. So now we can move on uh, down from verse 7 through 9. He said, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. So when Paul puts his works up against the work of Christ, he came up with a correct perspective. What was the definition? Let's just read it again. The art of drawing or having two solid objects on two dimensional surfaces where you can look at them both at the same time. That's to give the right impression of their height, their width, their depth, their position in relation to each other when viewed from a particular point. So, here he says, uh, what things were gained to me, I count it all. He puts his works up against the work and the perspective of the definition of that. We've seen what it was. He compared the two, the height, the width, the depth, and the position. He, he went up, he compared everything he has done to what Christ had done. Then he says, what I thought I gained, I quickly realized it wasn't nothing but a loss. Why was he doing and had that zeal and doing the things he did? He had it because he, like us, and every human being is wired to serve God. Whether we realize that or not, we are wired. We have a spirit. The only reason we have a spirit is so we can relate to the spirit of God. And so when those two things come together... Then you can get your worship right. You can get everything right. So why was he doing all this? Why was he so zealous? Why was he worshiping uh, himself and the law and all these things? Because he was wired to do that. But he had the wrong perspective. When he got the right perspective, compared the two, man, he was awake then. He, and of course it takes the Spirit of God to do that. I totally get it. But I'm talking to the believers this morning that's saved, that's washed in the blood, Amen. that the Holy Spirit is in your heart. So we still have to bring things in the correct perspective. So 
He says, those will gain to me, I counted loss for Christ. Now verse 8, now I'm going to move on quickly. Yea, doubtless. And what does that mean? So then no doubt about it when compared, when put in the correct perspective. Yea, doubtless. And I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. I count. Paul said, I've totaled up everything. In perspective, I put them together. I've totaled up everything. I've tallied it all up. Everything I come up with for me is a zero. And all for Christ. Christ compared to me is everything. Every work I've done up to this point before I got saved was zero. So he tallied it up. He come up with that perspective. Then... Uh, here he says, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Excellency means the superior, to be superior in rank, to surpass. To have received the gift of understanding, Paul says, of just who Christ is, surpasses every work I've ever done or every work I ever could do. That's Paul's perspective on Christ. He said, I tell it all up, I count it lost in verse 7. He said, I count it, tattled it all up again. I count all things I've ever done lost for the, the superiority of having received the knowledge of who Christ Jesus my Lord is. Then he says, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Why would you talk about suffering, Paul? He wrote this in prison. But Paul, I, and I, you know, and I still have some... People that disagree with me on this, it's fine. They can work out the old scripture and let the Holy Ghost teach them. I'm going to love them the same. They need to love me the same. But here's the deal. I think because of what Paul did, he threw people in prison. He's done this. He continually throw folks in prison. Where did he spend most of his ministry? In prison. Was he forgiven? Yes. But he reaped what he sowed. I mean, I can go... I, I, and man, I, I ain't even getting into that. There's a lot of things I can do. But you know what? I'm still reaping some stuff. I've been forgiven for 24 years on some stuff. 24 years this year. I'm doing my math right. Yeah. Two thousand. Yeah, yeah. 91. That's it. 24 years. But you know what? I still got word the other day that a guy, as a kid, I give my first joint to, still strung out on meth today. It hurts me. Am I forgiven of that? Yeah, but I got him on the wrong road. He's still there. That still grieves me. I, I can lay a bunch of other grocery lists of junk out there that I did. I took some things from somebody that they could never get back. But God never intended to be there. But it happened. But anyway, I still have to live with those effects. Paul was in prison though he was forgiven and the Holy Ghost was obviously filling him mm -hmm. beyond measure like no other man has relating some stuff but he had to get him isolated and get him to this set but his perspective changed everything about him and that's what's important for us coming in so he, he said I've suffered that means his perspective left him with some damage his perspective of Christ left him with some damage. It had and had an effect on his lifestyle. So then he says the e part of this, I've, uh, what I've lost is but dumb. Look at that. He said, uh, let me find my place here. He said, I, what I've suffered the loss of all things. I mean, he had nothing. I'm sure when he was now, I'm sure what he did paid pretty good in his day. It was a payment for it. Man, he would go he would go to kings and governors and get letters to do these things. He was strutting. He had it rolling. He had it going on, as we would say. But look where he ended up. So it did suffer. It cost him something. And I'm going to tell you today, it's going to cost you something. Mostly it's just going to be a little mouth, a little persecution of the mouth from people who are not believers, but... You know, they might say something about you praying over your meal or something in, in public. Uh, but I like what this guy said the other day. He said he was at uh, Waffle House and he prayed with his family and, and the guy started laughing and mocking behind him. 
And he said, all these Christians want to go around here and pray in public. He said, well, all these atheists want to try to shut us all up. He said, I ain't saying nothing to you about your atheism. You don't say nothing to me about my belief in God. I'm going to pray and bless my food because I'm thankful for it. And it's almost like, how far you want to go with this? You know, we'll go far as you want to go with it. I mean, <laughs> either shut up and let me alone, I'll shut up and leave you alone. I mean, you know, it's kind of the way it is, but they want to push it down. But it's going to cost you something. But the E part of this, he said, what I've lost, I counted, but done. Notice this. Man, I got to find my... And, do, and I do count them. I do tally all of them up. And you know what? They're dumb. Anybody know what dumb is? Okay. <laughs> well, you ain't got to go into detail of that. Uh, but you know what dumb is? Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm just going to be discreet about it. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. <laughs> and as sweet as I can be. And if you got any other details you need to know, you can talk to me after class. Okay? <laughs> The thing that is left over and discarded. <laughs> okay? Okay, let's, we can get it going. That that is worthless and detestable. That's what Donald is. It's what's left over. It's what comes out after all the energy you know. You got it. All right, but Paul said, compared to what I've gained in the flesh, it's worthless, it's detestable, right. it's what's left over, it's discarded, it's the it's just the mess. Okay? That's what it is. <clears throat> he said, I count all that dumb that I may win Christ, that I may know Christ. Henceforth the title of the lesson, what I thought was gain, it's really worthless and detestable, it's dumb, it's lost. That's a biblical perspective on life and a biblical look on comparing what the flesh has to what the Spirit of God is and what Jesus Christ is. What, what was it, Isaiah? All our righteousness is filthy rags. Mm -hmm. That's just the truth of the matter. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your precious word this morning. Bless us as we go into this worship hour. Thank you for loving us now in Jesus' name. Amen.